so yes. Sean Sorry and I, like that. I said, did X a few years ago. Um, I'm just going to do a quick recitation of what this is, um, and then we'll get to talking about it. X is a 2022 American slasher film that was written, directed, produced, and edited by t- <laughs> playing shortstop Bugs Bunny, playing catcher Bugs Bunny, uh, by, by, by Ty West. It stars Mia Goth as both Pearl and um, Maxine. Um, stars Jenna Ortega before she became like the it horror girl. Martin Henderson, Brittany uh, Snow, Owen Campbell, Stephen Yur, and Scott uh, Mascuti. Kid Cody. That's right. That, it's yeah, her, wasn't it, this it, his first? Uh, I, I know that he was in the Bill and Ted's movie, uh, movie, but wasn't this his first one where he was like, I'm not yeah. Kid Cody, I'm Scott Mascuti. As an actual uh-huh. actor playing a yep, part. Yep. Yeah. He was yeah. credited by his actual given name. Yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't realize it was Kid Cootie until I rewatched it this past weekend. And you know, you watch it on it. If you watch Me it on neither. Amazon, it tells you about the actors. Oh and yeah. It, and so, like, if you look at the screen, and I happen to have moved my cursor or something like that, and I, I'm like, oh, that's Kid Cootie. Okay, then. Um, it's Cutty, Mark. In- Cutty, whatever. Um, Kid Kid Cash. Set in 1979, the film follows a cast and crew who gather to make a porno film on an elderly couple's rural Texas property, but find themselves threatened by hom- by the homicidal couple. It's a really simple plot, and I really want to get to talking about it. Um, basically, it is a long setup of these people showing up to the farm. Um, the executive producer sort of schmoozing the farm owner who after once he realizes this isn't just a guy passing through town it's a it's a gaggle of people and he really doesn't want them there so there's some like idle threatening going on and <laughs> this, the gun's not even loaded um but th- it's a long setup and a lot of discussion of what kind of woman does porn what is porn can you make art from porn etc 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 and then eventually we get to the elder couple struggling with sex and age to varying degrees. You have uh, Pearl, who still very much has sexual desires, and a husband who keeps saying, you know, thank you, my heart. Um, and then sort of looking at this group who feel like they're squandering their youth on filth. Um, and so slowly but surely, between the, the couple, they start killing these people off. There's a great kill with a gator. It's like my favorite kill of the whole movie. Um, and at the very end, Maxine is able to get away, um, leaving the uh, ruins of this farm and film footage behind. So I will go to you first, Pat, and then Alexis, and then I'll run back to Sean. Um, let's talk about some of your initial thoughts on this movie. I will give you a couple of starters. When Sean and I talked about it, as Alexis mentioned, we talked a lot about the aesthetic. Um, that it was, it definitely felt like an ode to the tech, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Tea Party, and all. Um, there is the there's like a grain graininess o- filter over the camera that makes the film seem aged. Um, it's it's not a movie that relies in any way, shape, or form on necessarily jump scares. Um, the kills are visceral and grisly, but not exactly graphic or, um, gross, believe it or not. And a lot of this movie, like, the which major, also, which also reminded me of Texas Chainsaw. Yeah. Which the major pillar of this movie was the thematic elements it's, to the point that, and I, I'm going to shut up and let you talk, but when I heard the it's guys over critically acclaimed talk about X and they were like, Oh, it's just it's about a film crew that gets killed by an old, you know, an old couple, and the movie isn't really about anything. I was like, did you miss the 87 themes this movie got into? Yeah, Footloose is about dancing. Yes, they yeah. did. Yeah. All yeah. of them. Like, Every you, single one. Professional film critics managed to miss the point that badly. But they were so, too distracted by Mia Goss boo. How, how uh, I mean, how how many years has Doug Walker been around now? Fair. So Pat, I threw a lot out there. Pick anything and give it a chew. So when I saw it <clears throat> for the first time in full, I didn't get to see it in theaters initially. I got to see it, you know, at home. Right. But watching it, you know, my initial thought was, this is Texas Chainsaw Massacre if it was directed by Last House on the Left here, uh, Wes Craven. Mm-hmm. Where, again, the marriage of the setting, the characters in place, the quote-unquote villains, however you want to portray them, of what they are, you know, they're the local folk who have these invaders or whatever you want to refer to them as that they believe have no moral compass and it's up to them to set things straight 
And it's got a little bit of another movie I love and is near and dear to my heart. And it kind of feels like if it was released at the same time, it would have been marketed the same way. If y'all have ever seen a little picture called Motel Hell. Um, yeah, I was pretty sure you guys all had. But basically, an old, old couple who runs a motel, you know, attracts, you know, sexually deviant youth there and kills them and serves them as food to people. Spoilers. Yeah, the head sticking out of the ground, making that cackling sound because they've cut their vocal cords. That's the kind of crap that I will throw you. that on the list. That sounds amazing. Mo motel Hell is pretty much exactly what he says on the tin. <laughs> but, but it, it's a marriage of all those a little bit of an homage to all those mm -hmm. while trying to keep an updated format that would get it taken seriously today whereas again if it was released at the same time as some of its you know films that it's tributing it would be a midnight movie or drive-in double feature type you know release it would be on monster vision with joe bob briggs absolutely and we'll get to usa up yeah. all night a little later because <laughs> uh, that's definitely a part of this too um, but you know, it, it's one of those films where it, it knows the modern audience's sensibilities towards certain things. We're a much more sex positive culture as a whole uh, than, you know, you could speak to in the late seventies, early eighties, despite, you know, movements in a certain direction then. Um, so people are much more open to that. Look at a business like OnlyFans that supports millions of people today. People have a much more open mind when it comes to those things. So they're going to be more supportive of porno pornographic actors and actresses and producers than they would have then, where, you know, a guy like John Holmes is a pariah to people then. Now he would be seen as somebody who's, you know, maybe brave and making choices that, you know, are hard to make. And I don't have the guts to do it, but he does good for him type of thing. I, um, I just want to say all, all love to Pat. Those are all some fantastic points. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. And, I, uh, yeah. You haven't said a word I disagreed with. We'll get there. Don't worry. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. But but the thing about it is, while having to appeal to those modern audience sensibilities, you know, the big get for them was Jenna Ortega, mm -hmm. who at this point had name name juice and has a huge following regardless of what she does. So that's a massive coup when you need, still need to realize you need to make money on this movie. Right. Uh, the fact that Kid Cudi was in it is kind of amazing, too, um, which they didn't even really advertise that he was a part of it. I think he did more plugging of it. Hey, I got a new movie coming out. Go see it. Um, but he has a very devoted following of people. And so to get names like that to participate in a movie like this, while also getting someone like Mia Goth, who's extremely talented, but had never had a proper showcase to really do what she did in this movie, you're getting a lot of different moving pieces together to keep them organized, to keep them set, was executed so properly. And give credit to the art direction for getting the visuals just right when it gets that grainy, grindhousey look as it's been shipped around and held in poor containers and didn't get all the way to where it needed to be in mint condition uh, yeah. to set the stage, to set the mood. The scoring was really, really well done. Again, you're talking about a movie that doesn't predicate itself on jump scares and not necessarily the most visceral killings. I mean, I brought up Motel Hell. That's very visceral compared to what we see here. Mm -hmm. Again, the, the more gruesome parts of Texas Chainsaw aren't even the ones that I don't think stick with people as such as, you know, Seeing a guy get bludgeoned in the back of the head with a hammer and his foot twitching I, when he hits I the ground. What I said to Sean, and um, you can react to this, and Alexis, if you want to also comment on this point in particular, be my guest. The thing I said to Sean about the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre as it relates to X is the mo the thing I reacted to the most is the woman screaming for the last, I don't know, hour and a half of that movie. Just as she's running from this crazed family. I'm exaggerating the time it took, but I mean, it feels like it goes on forever. And the more she's screaming, the more unsettling this movie becomes. It does. And, and yeah, the, yeah, the scene where, you know, Maxine eventually backs over Pearl and drives away yeah. is very much reminiscent of when, you know, the girl in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre finally gets into the back of the pickup. Yeah. And you see Leatherface dancing while she's screaming. <laughs> and she she has that Alexis um, chime in here. She has that sort of just that traumatic exhale of finally I can release all of this tension from screaming and running and being feared, you know, fearing for my life. Go ahead, Alexis. What kind of caught my attention about X is that it seemed like such a simple concept. So many horror films try to be way more overcomplicated with their setup and their plot. Nowadays, a lot of filmmakers, if they had tried to do something similar to X, we would have found out that oh. the the elderly couple had lured the these filmmakers to their farm, and they do this often, yes, and, and it was all a trap or something and, like. 
and they belong to a cult and you know and the, and the dog is also jamaican and you know it just goes on and on yeah and the truth is that all of this happens because flat out bad luck it's they mm -hmm. the they, the elderly couple do not realize that a porno is about to be filmed on there the uh, film crew doesn't realize this is about to happen. We don't even really get a lot of focus with Maxine, even though she is the main uh, star and she is the final girl. Nowadays, I think we would have a much more in-depth look from other filmmakers analyzing, you know, her psychological impact. It's like we find out more about her past. The whole idea that we find out at the very end, which they expand upon in Maxine about her father, I think would have been a much bigger plot point in the hands of a lot of other filmmakers ty there's west touches, said there's some touches sorry, of halloween with that yeah, yeah yeah i want you to keep going but there's some yeah. i needed to cut in there there's some touches of halloween with how they treat mia goth where you know they, they're focusing on so many of these other characters and as, as they eliminate the characters there's more of a focus on your final girl but mm -hmm. it doesn't it's, it's such a more of an ensemble and if you didn't know jamie lee curtis was the star you wouldn't by the, at the start of halloween yeah, kind of similar to what, kind of similar looking at Scream with Nev Campbell. You learn yeah. more and more about her mother being killed and the plot mm -hmm. line with what happened to her and how she was viewed by other town members and how that reflects on Sydney as a character. Again, I think in the hands of other filmmakers, they really would have focused more on Maxine's father and her upbringing as the daughter of a fundamental uh, minister, preacher. I don't know exactly what he is. Uh, Televangelist, I guess, would be the best way to praise it. Yeah, you know, probably a good way yeah, to put I, it. I was getting more in shape, skinnier Sam Kinison vibes from his video footage. Yeah, I do love that he's always on in the background, mm -hmm. even though yeah. we don't find out why he's in the background. Again, I think a lot of other filmmakers would have been focusing on that. And I love Ty West that he just has these elements very lightly put throughout the story. It isn't until you're it's all done and you leave that you realize how they're really interconnected. And I mm -hmm. love a story like that. It's one that really it's like I've got a story to tell, but I'm not going to beat you over the head with the symbolism in the setup. It's very different uh, from does, what a lot it, of other filmmakers do. Yeah, it does take some cues from another movie that's not necessarily, a, it's not even a horror movie. It's called Hardcore. Uh, it was released at the end of the 70s with George C. Scott, where basically he's a fundamentalist Christian, leads you know a very strong hand over his family. And his daughter goes on a trip with other fundamentalist Christian kids to go evangelize out in California. She runs away, and then basically he doesn't know what happened, finds out. She's been making pornographic films and she's getting up in the hands of somebody who could potentially be putting her in a snuff film and killing her. And along the way, he kind of adopts a surrogate daughter in this streetwise kind of girl who's helping him along the way, who's a prostitute, knows the people in that film industry, none of whom in that movie are portrayed as sympathetic, really, or uh, any kind of person you should be rooting for or having any kind of. I don't care if you live or die type of feeling towards other than the girl George C. Scott takes in who he's really not ever painted as the bad guy. He just is a very strict father with strict religious, you know, upbringing for his children, even though that's apparently what pushed his daughter out. Um, whereas the prostitute that he meets and adopts, you do start to feel for her along the way. And then they paint a very negative picture where it's like, Oh no, we're just using each other this whole time. Fantastic. To Sean, go from that to I'm the sorry. portrayal of positivity in the characters that you mm -hmm. have here with what they're doing and the fact that they all have an ultimate endgame goal, which is not uh, I want to be making dirty movies forever and selling myself out and catching a disease and dying young. I No, I want to become a legitimate actress. I want to be a star. I want to do this. I want to do that. There are relatable, understandable goals, and that helps to humanize them a lot more and vilify them a lot less. Something I thought about, Sean um... – Thinking back to our conversations about the movie, about sex and agency and all of that, specifically the scene where Jenna Ortega is like, why can't I do a porno scene? We talked at length about it. I don't want to necessarily rehash it. But I had another thought as I watched the movie a second time uh, for this for this podcast. I was thinking about all the years we've been talking about horror on here. And one of the things that you, me, and Robert and everybody else that's covered it has talked about is how unlikable your cast is and how... Every everything about the environment, the setting, etc., seems to just be a setup so that we can kill the meat. And what what makes X particularly superior to a lot of horror movies is that scene with if you get if you get away from the theme of of sex and agency and just deal with the relationship between Jenna Ortega and the 
the the um the director of the movie and they talk about like they're they're having like a legitimate very realistic to me feeling uh fight about you know and like there's a lot of anxiety of between the why two can't of them. i do the scene well not only that but she's like is he gonna leave me now because of this it, you know and then him going if she fucks another guy is she still gonna want to be with me those are all real very anxiety inducing feelings <laughs> and had the movie gone in a slightly different direction they would continue to have the you know like the discussion is so funny. The discussion between the producer and the director, where he basically was like, if you want a good relationship, just let your woman do whatever she wants. And I was like, okay. slow clap, sir. <laughs> just preach on. Um, but my point well, there is, is say, there is something to be said about he's just like, look, it's like either she does this or if we you don't let her do this and it's going to be so absolute hell. Yeah. yeah. So the point that I was getting to is um the, it gets into this relationship movie gets interrupted by a horror movie, and I, that's kind of what I love about this is that Ty didn't forget that he was living that he was setting this movie in as realistic a world as he could, and it just gets interrupted by these you know series of horrific events, which I didn't think about when we first talked about it, but it became very apparent to me this time. Mm -hmm. So I was curious to get your reaction to that. Well. I'll be honest, I wouldn't entirely agree that the story is necessarily entirely simple for that and so many more reasons that you pointed out. And that's that, number one, if you really go back on the second viewing, every single death in the movie is foreshadowed. Mm -hmm. In some sneaky M. Night Shyamalan in the sixth sense way or another, every single one of them is set up with a remark or a scene or in at least one or two cases a piece of background scenery it's actually let's face it pretty fucking clever and i think it takes a special kind of writing to make an effective horror movie where not only among the victims but even among the monsters there is not a 100 percent unlikable person the two even the el even the elderly couple you have to look at the fact that they're confronting the end of their life in a sexually frozen marriage that they are locked into because they are hardcore monogamous and that very understandable human desire is kind of it's it's there, but they can't act at any point whatsoever. And they're watching this really free brand of young people come onto their come onto their property in the throes of the revolution. And they're able to just it kind of really let themselves be free because it's acceptable at that time, like it wasn't in there when they when they could have. And as we learn in Pearl, there's there's a whole deeper strata of backstory behind her issues. So much so that, yes, while one half of the equation is doing monstrous things, you still can't entirely hate them or keep from feeling at least a little bit sorry for them along the way. Yeah. It's not like they're it's not like they're an inscrutable evil like Freddy Krueger or Michael Myers or Jason or Jason Voorhees, where there is no rhyme or reason behind why they really do what they what they do especially when it comes to myers it's people where at some point you almost kind of want to root for them with the exception of the fact that the people that they're killing are really ultimately only trying to help them in the end and be as accommodating and respectful as they could while i mean hashtag sex work is work pursuing a very valid career option that they were hoping was going to lead to something else if you want to get into the nitty-gritty of like sin and horror he does have to lie to the guy to get to, to, to get the the farm and he they're trying to keep what they're doing from him he, uh, okay he, he he does that part that part is dishonest but he's not doing anything with the intention to necessarily yeah, yeah, yeah. hurt no. And he, he's not out there hurting anyone. Well, let's let's even touch on RJ and Jenna Ortega's character. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name right now. 
Um, it doesn't matter. We just Lorraine, don't know it's Jenna it? Ortega. I, I, I think I think it's Lorraine, it's, isn't it? Might be. Oh, well, we'll call her Lorraine. I'm uh, between Lorraine and RJ. Um, you can't really fault Lorraine because she's lived a very clearly sexually sequestered, sheltered life. And she's an adult who's anxious to spread her wings and she wants to be as liberated as any other. And she sees that her boyfriend is allowed to stand there and film this all day. Why can't she participate in it too in any way she wants? We didn't, and, talk about it the, uh, we didn't talk about it the first time, but I do think it's an interesting thing that I picked up on it this time around of her going, Okay, so you're, you're all making the argument that sex is just sex, and sex with you know a variety of people is perfectly fine because it's mean because it doesn't really mean anything for one reason or another. And then she goes, "Well, what about the what? What about love?" She's asking a question that I think the audience is struggling with, at least some some of the audience, which is, <laughs> "Is sex any good without love? Um, are sex it and can, love it depends. permanent?" Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, these are all rhetorical questions. Is sex and love, you know, forever intertwined? You know, and and, I, and I, she's wrestling with these ideas, and they're all kind of kicking it around like like a you know, um, like a think tank. And it's that's why I said that that scene where she's talk where they're talking about it is one of the most interesting ones of the movie because it really does put it out there for the audience to wrestle with, and the the, the movie doesn't necessarily come down one way or the other. On the argument, it just sort of it, it does what movies should do best, which is put it out there for the audience to figure out. Well, but even but even then, you have a dynamic where you still can't necessarily be mad at Lorraine and RJ because right. what happened was you and I are both in the lifestyle. We know how this goes. Um, they decided to give it a try. It hit at least one of them harder in places that they didn't really expect, and. It, it right. fell apart. That doesn't oh, make either right. of them bad right. people for experimenting with uh, it, especially at that right. at that age, because they tried to be as responsible and understanding as they could. Right. And as it as it happens, you and I both know it ultimately just didn't pan just didn't yep. pan out. And for nobody time, else for time's sake get wrap up because I want to ask one, Alexis one more question and then we're gonna move to the Yeah, uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'll do that. Um, and ultimately you have a movie where you're just kind of, you can just kind of sit and just watch the car crash unfold without really knowing who you're necessarily rooting for to come out great in the end, because you can't really patently hate any of them. Not if you're watching it, honestly. So Alexis, I've been trying to, uh, Alexis. Yeah, I'm still here. Sorry. I had to check. <laughs> yep, something. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm not going to do what I did last time and get into such a deep, you know, uh, thought process that I completely ignore <laughs> what everyone else is saying. You're <laughs> fine. I just want to make sure again. I had your, I, I didn't want to throw it to you when you're not even looking at the field. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I was listening, but I had a message pop in. I was like, recording. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> so I've been trying to weave you into the conversations of things that were already started, but I did want to give you um, one last opportunity before I move this on to bring up any points that you wanted to bring in before we close the book on X for good. Well, continuing what Sean was saying, I think it's also important to talk about it's not just so much the idea of sex and love. It's the she sees these it's two couples, you know, mm -hmm. technically you have. Um, oh, my God, I can't even remember the names of these the, the characters. Jackson, names. Hole. Bob, Jackson and Bobby Lynn. And you mm -hmm. have Wayne and Maxine, who are couples. Right. And then, yeah, you have Bobby Lynn sleeping with her boyfriend on camera, but then you have Maxine sleeping with Bobby Lynn's boyfriend. And then you see them all cuddles and everything, and she's just like, how do you do that? How are you able... And that is an interesting question. So you polyamory or not, there is a lot to be said. It's like, okay, there, I am okay with my significant other sleeping with someone, but does that mean I'm okay with watching them do it? Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said about that, especially the fact that you know, even though Lorraine says she wants to be a, to be in the film, she's basically telling her boyfriend, not only do I want to sleep with another guy, not only do I want it to be on film, I want you to film it. Mm -hmm. And I don't care how you approach it. That's a lot for RJ to take in a one minute well, conversation. Well, but the fact, but the fact is, since you're bringing the lifestyle into it, those are conversations that have 
that take place for playtime. People setting limits, establishing them, making sure that everyone jives with them. And in the ideal in the ideal scenarios, if not everybody is on that same page, then right. To take it a little bit, to take it a little bit further. RJ isn't in the lifestyle. He's exactly. directing a movie, and and so having been there myself, without getting into my personal stuff, when you are pushed ass backwards, wait, this isn't going to be about your dog, is it? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Right in okay, Mace's Pat, window, pal. Pat, I'm sorry. I'm giving. I am giving you a slow clap of approval for that one. That oh, was a God, good. God, I one. wish I had. I wish I had up, remembered to upload the seal that uh, fucking Dorian sent me. I'd fucking play it for you now. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, when you get pushed ass backwards into a lifestyle that you're not ready for, it has all kinds of unintended consequences. Exactly. Um, there's nothing to say that RJ and Lorraine couldn't weather the storm of. Um, non-traditional relationship dynamics, but when you're not even prepared, pre when you don't even know it exists, and you're being, you know, and you're pushed into it, because because again, he RJ's coming from the standpoint of view of I want to is very much reminded me of the Deuce and um, what the hell's her name's um, uh, Maggie gosh. Gyllenhaal, yeah, Maggie Gyllenhaal's ca character of why can't we make artsy? Why, why can't we take the pornographic genre and do something artistic with it? Which because the Coen been. brothers don't fucking direct it. I, I, you know, I've seen enough of this stuff to know that you can absolutely do weird and artsy and wonderful things. Oh, uh, I mean, one of, one of the what, what, one of the things I learned fairly recently is just how much work you would be stunned goes into goes into that. Just how much yeah. production, thought, planning, prep. So the point Ooh. of it is, he's not here because of a relationship dynamic. He's here because he wants to do something with his craft. And his girlfriend's just turning around and going, well, now non-traditional relationship dynamics exist. And I would like to explore this. And he was like, it's funny. I actually said this to somebody last night. And then we are just moving on. Um, I said, sometimes you get together with somebody. And you get together with them as they are. And then they become a completely different person. Not bad or, or good. It just is. And you don't like the new person they turned into. And that's okay, but that's something you have to acknowledge. With that said, uh, if there's nothing else, um, just a real quick 10 word or less, how much did you love X, Alexis? I will say that if in the context of the trilogy, I would rate it as my second favorite. Second best? Okay. Yeah. Pat, same question, 10 words or less, and I really mean that, Dusty. <laughs> how much do you love X? Uh, 7.9 out of 10. 7.9 out of 10? Okay. All right. Moving on to 